I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, workshop. Glad to be here and, and thank you for all for coming. Um, so I lead the uh, Irregular Barium Project and what I'll talk today is our pathway, our, our pathway for managing summer fruit lid abscission uh, in avocado. Okay, so starting off with a little background. So as you're all aware, irregular, irregular bearing is a significant challenge for many uh, growing production regions in Australia, including Western Australia. Uh, and this graph here illustrates this point where yields in tons per hectare can vary from season to season. Um, and the major drivers for this is flower abscission due to poor fruit set, fruit lid abscission, as well as biennial bearing. And as uh, avocado production has increased, um, oversupply issues are starting to become an issue. And with more plantings coming into, berry, into bearing, these uh, issues will only increase further. Therefore, developing management strategies to deal with irregular bearing would greatly benefit the industry's ability to establish export markets to deal with these oversight supply issues, as well as maintain profit, profitability for the industry. All right, so the major drivers for avocado flower and fruit abscission are excessive flowering, which depletes carbohydrate reserves uh, in the trees required for fruit set and early fruit development, a vegetative bias that diverts carbohydrates away from flowers and fruitlets in a dominant fashion, uh, and then also climate factors. So low, low and high temperature as well as low humidity can impact these process, processes in a negative manner. Okay, so the focus for this presentation will be on fruit lid abscission, more importantly on summer fruit lid abscission as it's been estimated that the trees have invested up to 40% dry matter into those fruits at that time. Uh, and we've been able to show that um, this can impact tree product, negatively impact tree productivity by 24%. Okay, so one of the first things we asked in the project is, is there a change in growth associated with summer fruit abscission? So in this particular trial, we used fruit dendrometers, uh, which we can then capture changes in the diameter of fruits in a daily manner. And from this, we can calculate the daily growth rates, in this case, for persisting fruits with a normal growth rate. Now, during the course of this trial, fruit subsized, and so we took that growth data and put it together. Uh, and what we find is that fruits undergo growth arrest. They then shrink and subside from the tree. And so from this work, we conclude that that abscission is really a secondary event, and the primary event is fruit growth arrest, followed by seed coat senescence, and then abscission. So when it comes to managing abscission, it's not really necessarily about managing abscission per se, but rather managing growth arrest. So throughout the project, we asked, how can uh, fruitlet growth rest be managed? So here we investigated whether or not irrigation could be used as a method to manage uh, summer fruitlet growth arrest. So what we, uh, so if water, if a lack of water availability is causing fruitlet growth arrest and abscission, then what we hypothesized is that there would be differences in the growth potential between fruits with a normal growth rate that are persisting and fruits that are switched from a normal to a resting growth rate. So what we found is that the arresting fruits here in red, the water potential is no different from that from the normal growing fruits. So from this, we conclude that developing new irrigation systems may not be a viable pathway to mitigate summer fruitlet abscission. We next asked whether or not nutrition or fertilization could be used as a method and here we hypothesized that fruit growth arrest could be stimulated by some sort of mineral element or elements deficiency. Uh, 
And so therefore, we, we would predict then that that when we compare the mineral element profiles between persisting and arresting fruits, that the resting fruits would display some sort of deficiency or lower levels of a mineral element or elements. However, when we did this analysis, there was no indication that there was a deficiency in mineral elements. So from this, we conclude that developing a new nutrition programs may not be a viable pathway to mitigate summer fruit abscission. So then we asked the question of whether or not growth arrest could be associated, associated with the change uh, in carbohydrate status of the fruit. So just to remind you that carbohydrates are taken up by the fruits via the seed coat and then distributed to the embryo, endosperm, as well as the periocarp tissues. When we evaluated, did sugar profiling, starch, and did some gene expression studies based upon these results, what it looks like is that there's a decrease in carbohydrate supply when fruits switch from a, low to, from a normal to a low growth rate. There's a decrease in sucrose metabolism in the seed coat, embryo, and pericarp. The embryo, we see a hyperaccumulation of starch occurring late growth arrest. And in the pericarp, we see a change in C7 sugar metabolism. And once again, there's no um, evidence for a, a, a mineral element deficiency involved. But most importantly, what we see in the seed coat is a depletion of soluble sugars and starch, as well as an activation of a carbohydrate starvation pathway. So in the literature and basic model plant systems, they know that interactions between hormone and sugar signaling and metabolism is important for regulating growth. Okay, and so um, for example, auxin interacts with sugar signaling, as well as does ethylene, abscisic acid, as well as gismonic acid. So what we would predict then that if we want to manage summer, summer fruitlet uh, abscission, probably the best pathway forward is by understanding the hormonal growth of fruit growth arrest, and then taking that to try to develop uh, a, a plant growth regulator based application to manage this problem. Okay, so in this next section, I'll talk about our work investigating the hormonal control of fruitlet growth arrest. So in this analysis, we looked at a, a, a set of hormones here, auxin, ethylene, abscisic acid, and gismonic acid, and we compared the, these hormone profiles between persisting and fruits that switch from a normal to a low growth rate, uh, and we're looking here at, at a relatively late period of growth arrest. So I'll first start off and talk about auxin. So auxin is the fundamental hormone that regulates fruit growth and, and development. So auxin is critical for fruit set. It's critical for both the cell, div cell division and cell expansion phases of fruit growth. And the decline in auxin is critical for fruit maturation and this transition from maturation to ripening. Okay, so the primary auxin produced in plants is indole-3-acetic acid, or IAA, and the free IAA levels are controlled both by biosynthesis as well as conjugation, which acts to inactivate this hormone. So, for example, in this case, uh, IAA has been conjugated with uh, aspartic acid. Okay, so when we measured auxin in this pericope seed cart of em sorry pericarp, seed coat, and embryo of normal growing fruits, what we find is that in the seed coat, we get about 10 to 11 fold higher levels of auxin than in the pericarp and embryo, indicating that the seed coat is really a factory for auxin production uh, at this developmental stage. When we compared the auxin profiles between normal growing and arresting fruits, what we find is that in the pericarp and seed coat, we see a significant decline in the levels of IAA, and in the seed coat in particular, we see an increase in the levels of IAA conjugated with aspartic acid. And this sort of pattern here is very similar to what occurs in tomato when they undergo fruit maturation. And then in the embryo, we don't see any changes in the levels of, 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 this, of uh, IAA. So from this, we conclude that that the fruit, fruit growth 
arrest signal likely targets IA biosynthesis and or conjugation in the maternal tissues. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we also looked at ethylene abscisic acid and desmonic acid as they've also been implicated in abscission. So what we find is that in arresting fruits, there's an increase, significant increase of ABA in the periocarp, but in the seed coat, we see a significant, significant increase in ethylene and gismonic acid. And in the embryo, there's no change or no increase in levels of these hormones. So from this, it looks like in the maternal tissues, that is the pericarp and, pericarp and seed coat, that ethylene, gismonic acid, and abscisic acid are acting in these maternal tissues to, to promote fruit growth arrest. Okay, so we come up with the following pathway where the mother plant is generating some sort of growth arrest signal that gets taken up and elicits a sugar starvation response in the seed coat that then leads to, that then targets IA to, de to, de to decrease IA levels in the maternal tissues. That also stimulates abscisic acid production in the pericarp, ethylene and gismonic acid in the seed coat, and together this whole uh, uh, network would then act to promote growth arrest. Now as these fruits, after growth arrest, ethylene and, and gismonic acid would then act to promote seed coat senescence, and then finally, through the actions of, of all of this, uh, you would get fruit abscission. So in Apple, they've also investigated immature fruit abscission. And work from here indicates that the mother plant generates a nutritional stress signal that causes uh, a sugar signaling response pathway in the cortex of the fruit, that is the part of the fruit that you eat, derived from the hypanthium. Uh, and that generates ABA, or abscisic acid, ethylene, and reactive oxygen species, or ROS. And from this, they proposed um, that ethylene acts as the key signal that moves from the cortex to the seed to promote seed abortion, causing the fruits to stop growing, stop developing, and as a result, that ultimately leads to fruit abscission. Okay, so in this model here, ethylene is playing a key factor in this process. So before I go on and talk about how we think from a developmental perspective, how f immature fruit abscission is occurring, I need to take a step back and talk briefly about fruit development. So fruits undergo sequential phases of, sequential phases of growth and development, starting with a growth phase that's initiated after fruit set, they then transition to a maturation phase and then to a ripening slash senescence phase that's associated with abscission. Now, not only in fruits, but also leaves and floral organs, plants have evolved checkpoints. And these checkpoints ensure that fruits or other organs grow to the appropriate size. And in the case of fruits, there's a really key checkpoint that occurs during the maturation phase that prevents fruits from undergoing premature ripening abscission. So in order for a fruit to abscise, they must undergo maturation past this checkpoint, which then allows those fruit to become competent to ripen and abscise. Okay, and one of the key factors or hormones in this process is surprise, surprise, is auxin. So once again, auxin is critical for growth and it's the decrease in auxin that stimulates the maturation phase and is absolutely critical for this transition phase. Okay, so, um, so in summary, developing fruits, fruitlets typically undergo ripening and abscission after they pass this checkpoint. So what we propose is happening in avocados to cause fruitlet abscission is that there's this growth arrest signal generated either in the shoot or fruit that's mobile in nature. So either moving through the xylem or phloem, it's taken up by developing fruits, shoots, and roots. So what we propose within this model, or what we would imagine, is that the populations of fruits that exist in the tree, there would be some fruits with a relatively lower growth potential, some with a higher growth potential. And that growth potential is gonna be a reflection 
of the auxin and carbohydrate levels in these fruits. Okay, and that the ability of this signal to cause abscission is going to be determined by a threshold. So fruits that have a growth potential and, and, and have a concentration of auxin and carbohydrates below this threshold are going to undergo abscission, and ones above that will persist. Okay, now throughout the, the, the summer growth season, there's probably going to be periods of time where you're going to get a temporary decrease in carbohydrate availability, particularly when the summer flush initiates or when you have high temperature and low humidity. And under those conditions, that would then reduce overall carbohydrate levels in the fruits, shift this, shift this threshold to your right, and that would represent a fruit drop event. At the fruit level, um, that didn't come out, huh, okay, uh, can I back up, okay, so at the fruit level, so getting at the fruit level of things, what we imagine is going on um, is that both carbohydrates and auxin uh, are stimulating uh, growth, uh, and when we look at the data, both the hormone data, the sugar data, and the gene expression data, we come up with, with our following reasons. So, what we see is a substantial decrease in auxin activity, which once again is a, acts as a maturation signal. The increase in ABA and jasmonic acid in the pericarp and seed coat respectively is quite interesting because it's known these hormones promote seed maturation and dormancy. From the gene expression data, we see that there's a conserved dormancy signaling pathway activated in the seed, particularly the seed coat and embryo. In the embryo, we see the accumulation of starch, and we see some uh, key maturation regulatory genes that are highly induced uh, that, that may be functioning and transitioning the maternal tissues from something that's growing to maturing. So what we imagine then is that when uh, carbohydrates become limiting, these growth arrest signals act in two ways. One is to repress auxin or to reduce auxin levels, and the second is to cause the production of jasmonic and, AS and ABA. And together, these two activities would transition fruits from a growth phase to a maturation phase. And as a result, that would stimulate growth arrest. Now, ethylene is probably playing a role in this. Um, definitely, we know from the literature that applying ethylene to growing organs will inhibit cell proliferation, um, but we don't know whether or not ethylene is a stimulating maturation. So as fruits move from this growth phase to the maturation, they pass the checkpoint, and when they do, they now become competent to undergo, in this case, seed coat senescence and abscission, and ethylene and jasmonic acid uh, uh, would be critical for driving seed coat senescence in this scenario. So what we need to, what we've set up this past season are trials to look at what are the order of these events. And this is, becomes critical if we want to manage this problem. Okay, so what we did was set up trials to ask what are the early events particularly focusing on the seed coat because we think that's the critical organ that's mediating this process. Okay, so, um, and we're currently going through this data right now. But at any rate, by understanding what, what's happening early, we can then target those hormones with the use of plant growth regulators to try to block or limit fruit growth arrest in order to uh, increase productivity. Okay, so in summary, uh, we've been able to show that summer fruitlet growth arrest is likely going to be linked to the activation of a fruit maturation-like phase, which, which ultimately leads to fruitlet abscission. We've looked at ways to manage this problem. So we've looked and addressed whether or not irrigation could be potentially used. Our results indicate probably not. We've looked at nutrition, same result. Uh, and most likely way that we can see going forward to manage summer fruitlet abscission is through the use of some sort of PGR-based application, 
targeting oxen, ethylene, jet, and or gismonic acid to, to try to find ways to allow fruits to sort of persist when carbon uh, availability, availability becomes limiting. Okay, so I'd like to thank the people that did the work uh, from the carbohydrate and gene expression studies, from the hormone studies, field work, um, extension, uh, and also the growers and farm managers from these orchards that allow us to come in and torture trees and so on, uh, Avocados Australia for their support, and Horn Innovation for funding. So thank you for your attention at this time of the afternoon. Uh, happy to take questions. Assuming we do actually manage to stop a position, would that lead to an alternate bearing the following year? Like um, if the tree is then depleted of reserves from managing that extra fruit, will that have a subsequent follow-on negative impact? Um, that's a good question. Um, so what we're targeting is, is, is summer fruit abscission. And because, the, as I mentioned, uh, the trees have already invested up to 40% dry matter in there. So as long as, those fr as long as those trees can maintain some summer flush being initiated, which is where flowers are derived from the following season, it, 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 should, it, it shouldn't have that much of an impact. But if you try to overload that tree too much, then of course you're gonna inhibit that summer flush and then you won't get the flowering next year. So there's gonna be a balance definitely required in, in, in all of this thinking. Have you played around with uh, some plant growth regulators like uh, prohexidine calcium or ethylene blockers um, like um, oh, well, MCP that we currently use or Havista? We, I'm, I'm an apple grower, so we, we use a lot of well, plant growth regulators, but have you tried playing around with these? Yeah, this past season we did. Um, and we used a combination, so we used um, a synthetic auxin. So if you apply uh, IA to, to trees or plants, when they take it up, they're just gonna conjugate it and degrade it. So you're not gonna get much of a response or it'll be a very short-lived response. So we used NAA, we used AVG, an inhibitor of gesmonic acid. Um, the problem with all these the plant growth rate and, and NAA is that, is that they can have negative effects. So the levels of NAA that we applied were half of what's been used in grape by uh, a team in our group in Adelaide uh, that, is, that was using NAA to um, inhibit ripening in grape. And at that concentration, we got a, a severe ethylene response. So NAA can induce ethylene. Um, AVG can also block oxygen biosynthesis as well as this inhibitor for gesmonic acid. So we went ahead and just trialed it to see what impact uh, these uh, hormones and plant growth regulators are going to have. But in, in the end, it's going to come down to figuring out what is that sweet spot that you can add these, these hormones or plant growth regulators that will have a positive impact without either inducing ethylene or inhibiting auxin biosynthesis. So we're just sort of at that stage now. Just wondering what comes first, the auxin um, being limiting or the carbohydrates? Like is one causing the other or? That's a very good question. Um, is there a good answer? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the problem is, is that quite often things feed back on each other. Um, my feeling is that it's probably going to be carbohydrate availability. So when you get this, when the tree decides, okay, we got to put out a summer flush, that some of that carbon is going to be now diverted into, into growing vegetative shoots. And so that's, uh, that decrease in carbon is probably going to reduce auxin levels. So we know, for example, um, there's a mutation in maize or corn called miniature one. 
uh, and uh, it's a mutation in an invertase that cleaves sucrose to glucose and fructose. And as the name, the, mutation, the mutant, uh, uh, in miniature one, it produces these miniature kernels, and they have very low oxen levels. So there's this really feedback loop between sugars, sugar metabolism, sugar signaling, and, and hormones. Um, yeah, but it's a great question. I mean, but my feeling is it's probably going to be some sort of carbohydrate supply issue that initiates it. And the question is, is can we develop an application that's going to allow a population of fruitlets to, to sort of ex persist during that temporary shortage until, let's say, that summer flush now switches from a, from a, a sink to a source. This is on a bit of a, bit of a contradiction where you're saying there was no difference in minerals, mm -hmm. and yet obviously there's a difference in the carbon. Yes. It's getting through. So how could that be? Uh, well, I mean, as I said, the water potential during the arrest, when they're arresting, isn't changing. So it's not as if the, everything stops flowing into the, into the fruit and it starts shrinking right away. And they're still hard. And they don't soften up until after they undergo growth arrest. So they, they still may be taking up uh, a, a water but, uh, but it's a good question. Um, but like I said, when we measure mineral elements, we do not see any deficiency in it. In our spring, in the flowering period, we have <clears throat> wildly different uh, light intensity and temperature and you know we can have blizzards like the middle of winter or we can have three or four days like the middle of summer do you reckon that light intensity and warmth governing photosynthesis could be the the trigger that would change the carbon flow to the fruit so it in happens it, in summer later yeah but um, so what you're getting at is whether or not can you increase carbon in the winter as a mechanism to... Yeah, probably, because the seasons are so different here mm -hmm. and the, the seasonal outcome with fruit is also so different. Is there a correlation? You know, some people say, oh, yeah, a low crop follows a high crop, and often it does, but the low crop may not be because of the high crop. It might be because of the, the, the spring. Like this last spring was really strange. I mean, it was basically winter and until it turned the next day into summer in about the end of the third week in November. And then it didn't rain again for three months. But we've had a ripper crop. So we did a lot of tree manipulations in this project. So defoliation, so we've defoliated early in the season, uh, about mid-December and then later on in January. Uh, and we followed those trees through the following year. And the ones that defoliated early in the season, when we looked at starch reserves um, in the stems, which is what fluctuates, um, they had the highest levels, whereas the ones that um, we defoliate later in the season, had a sort of a mid-range, um, and then we just looked at control trees. So the ones that had the highest amount of starch in those stems at bud burst had the highest level of flowering, okay? Whereas compared to the other ones that had a lower level. But when we looked at starch levels and stems at flowering when fruit set occurs, we saw lower levels in the ones that had the highest level of flowering. And when we looked at fruit set, fruit set tended to be lower and the ones that flowered hot had a higher flowering rate. So if you had a way to manage that level of flowering where you could pump up the carbon in the stems but hold back that flowering, you may be able to recover or 
put aside some, some carbons to support fruit set and fruit development, but the trees just wanna, they just wanna do their own thing. 